nothing about what I do is about standardization. It's about consistency and it's about faster production of information. Episode 140. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking to Dale Sinclair, who's the Director of Innovation at ACOM. So Dale is an architect and the Director of Innovation at ACOM, which is one of the largest infrastructure consultancies in the world. Now, his core expertise is in the delivery of large-scale projects using innovative, interdisciplinary workflow-aligned digital tools which have been developed within ACOM's technology partners. He's also an author. He's published a number of books on the LAD designer role on design management. And he also authored the ROBA Plan of Work 2020 and was recently described as a pragmatic futurist. He's also the ROBA's ambassador for collaboration and sits on the boards of the Construction Industry Council and BRE Global. So in this episode, it was really fascinating to talk to somebody working at a at this kind of scale. Um, and we talked a lot about the future of the industry, the kind of innovations that ACOM have been um, furthering to grow their business. And we looked at the future of construction and the role of the architect within that and the intersection between new technologies. So sit back, relax and enjoy Dale Sinclair. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Dale, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? Very good, thanks. Um, It's beginning to get dark here, but uh, it has been a beautiful day. So yes, uh, delighted to talk to you. Super, brilliant. Now, you are the Director of Innovation at ACOM. You're the lead author of the ROBA Plan of Works 2020 and the Lead Designer Handbook, and as well as being part of the uh, CIC board and it's you've got quite a um, distinguished career and as well as a very unique outlook on the construction industry and architecture industry and obviously your role of director as innovation of ACOM I think my, my first question is to ask to define what what is that what is the what is a director of innovation within a company like ACOM I suppose the, what we recognise as ACOM is that things are changing and things are changing fast. There, there, there's lots of different technologies out there. And and certainly, I would say even in the last six months, we've seen lots of uh, tech companies now coming to the property industry. And, you know, and, and, and certainly around technologies like IoT and, and or smart buildings and so on. So we're, we're seeing a lot of shift in, in the integration of technology and how we design. And and I've always been fascinated about the design process as much mm. as I have been about the, the product that we produce as architects. I, I guess in, in a sense, the producer role rather than the director role of, of the creative process. Yeah. And, and really what my job entails is uh, is, is figuring out, uh, you know, how to use new technologies on projects. So, so I'm very much immersed in, in, in a lot of diverse projects. Uh, and I have some really exciting clients that I'm lucky enough to work with as we try and figure out what the future looks like for the way that we design the buildings that we work on. So, so yeah, very exciting. And is this a role, how did your career evolve into occupying such a role? And, and was this role, did this role, previously exist at ACOM? Is it a role to be filled or was it one that you kind of created? I, th- I think the role kind of created itself. And mm. uh, I mean, I've, I've always been fascinated about technology and how it impacts the design process. So uh, years ago, I, w- I was one of the early kind of uh, movers in the shift from the drawing board to CAD, which in itself was a very tough kind of cultural shift. And I suppose what I see now is that was one technology that in some respects didn't really change much um, mm-hmm. and now we're seeing you know dozens of technologies coming to fruition at the same time and I, I think that underlines the complexity of, of the the training and and uh, you know the challenge that's ahead of us with all these exciting new prospects 
From your perspective, what are some of the most exciting um, future technologies that the construction industry and architecture industry industries should be adapting or or looking to as kind of the next big like paradigm shift even? Yeah, well, I think the talk about a paradigm shift is a really good one, Rion, because uh, I guess what I would say I see a lot of just now is us as professionals optimizing traditional. And and when, when we looked last year uh, at ACOM in terms of BIM and was it working or not working, I think the conclusion we came to that was that there were some great things happening. We were seeing these federated models being produced and... Uh, we were increasingly seeing more data being produced, but the use of these tools, tools was playing into uh, more traditional design processes. So, for example, where we use intuition rather than, let's say, embedded knowledge mm. uh, to design the buildings that we do. And and I, I think for me, the paradigm shift comes from trying to move away from drawings into a proper kind of 3D-centric data-driven world. And certainly... Uh, I think drawings are impeding innovation just now because we, we, on the whole, we see clients and also designers producing these fantastic models and then pushing them out into, into traditional drawings. And I think that impedes innovation. So for me, the paradigm shift comes from when we can really start to create spaces, for example. So if you can imagine if I'm designing a, a hospital, if I can go to a library of operating theaters and uh, imaging suites and so on, and then pull those into a modeling, modeling environment. So I'm, I'm not looking at a 2D process. I'm actually taking these spaces and pulling them into, um, into a model. And, and then I can really quickly get into a VR environment with a client. That, that's how I see the future. And then, of course, if we can use machine learning tools to figure out the optimal layout for those uh, spaces to come together, then we can really start to, to, to make our buildings much, much better. And of course, there, there's that whole dilemma as an architect of the inside outs, outside kind of uh, relationship and how do you optimize the outside of a building uh, in relation to the inside. And I, I think that's all the site exciting conversations we, we have to have ahead of us as we look to make the process much, much better. In, in the kind of projects that you're working on in ACOM, how do you begin to introduce these kinds of new technologies? And particularly if it's, you know, what kinds of risk are you having to manage if there's going to be the implementation of, of something quite dramatic in a, a shift in approach? Or does it happen incrementally? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I, I suppose we're looking at lots of different things in, in parallel. So we're, we're looking at smart buildings and, and what does that mean for the information we need to gather. The, the challenge that we see for clients is, so for example, I'm designing a facility just now that is both a hospital and a university in, in the same ilk. And the thing is, how do you design a building today that's not going to be opened uh, for another five years when you know that in five years time, the technology, uh, let's say around IoT sensors and smart buildings is gonna be insanely different than it is today. So I think that is increasingly gonna be a challenge for us as designers is how do we you know, f form some of these systems into contracts when we, well, we haven't even conceived it yet. It's like when you hear people talking about the jobs of the future that don't exist yet. It, yeah. It's the same. The technologies that will be in our buildings in, in the future don't exist. So how do we plan to design buildings today when the future is quite different? Do you, it's interesting how you were saying that drawing information actually impedes the development mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of design. Could you go into a little bit more depth around that and how, how you see that operating? Is it, is it to do with the fact that in modern construction, we're so onerous and so kind of worried about legal consequences that we end up kind of producing this surplus of drawn information to make sure that there's some sort of record of, of evidence or is not, that not, not, no, not, not really. I, I think it's what, what it's more to do with is that I think the value is in the 3D model itself. And e even if you if you can imagine the space that you're sitting in just now and look around you and mm. try to think how many of the junctions can actually be captured in 2D information, you, you realize, actually, wow, that, that it would take a lot of information 
to capture this. And and when you start to model spaces in 3D, showing every single junction. So in some of the work that we're doing now, we're modeling the screws in our kind of, um, you know, in our kind of manufacturing information. When you realize the level of detail that you can get into a 3D environment, you realize that trying to translate that into 2D is actually part of the problem uh, rather than part of the solution. Plus the other thing, Rion, is for me, is um, a 2D view is a completely different prospect to a drawing. So I'm mm. a big fan of 2D views. Right. And you might say, well, wait a minute, why, why do you like 2D views and not drawings? Because drawings create post-production and a lot of the workflow required um, in, not, in that post-production creates inefficiency. So I, I guess what I'm keener to do is to get the clients and project managers into our 3D space. And again, I'll, part of the irony of the, the level two BIM stuff is that we, ha- we as designers have had to create this federated model and create all the workflow around that. But then we find that uh, project managers and clients and some other people in the team then want 2D information. And, and what I'm thinking was, well, wait a minute, why, why can't all these people that uh, are looking at the 2D, 2D information just come into our environment, come into our models? And, and, and that's the sort of thing that we've been looking at. So for, for example, is creating a model viewer that's uh, got a much more intuitive user interface to the clients. So we can bring clients into that space and make them feel more comfortable in a 3D environment where they can certainly view the models with a much greater degree of uh, comfort and then clarity. Yeah, you, you were saying how some of the consultants that you work with, um, you know, they might be asking for 2D information when you've been working predominantly in a 3D environment and you've been inviting the client into into those places and spaces for them to experience the the buildings. Um, How do you go about integrating seamlessly, you know, if one player of the consultant team is kind of quite technologically sophisticated and then other consultants are not, how do you balance that out? And is that something that kind of needs to be addressed as a, as a industry? Certainly, I mean, well, one of the benefits I have in terms of innovating is most of the projects I'm doing, it's a one ACOM offer. So we have the whole ACOM team in, in that 3D world. I, I tend to find it's it's not the design team that are the challenging uh, kind of players. It's more some of the peripheral people, even some of the specialists that are not necessarily used to, and, and even some of our ACOM specialists, uh, without naming any names, um, they're, are, they're still used to working with CAD files rather than coming into the 3D model. So some, sometimes there, you, you just need to be pragmatic about that and we can take uh, their CAD files and convert that into 3D information. There, there's, there's no right or wrong way. Yeah. Uh, and, and certainly, but what I would say is that I, I don't see the, the, the benefit in dumbing down the whole process to do 2D just because one or two players uh, can't come into the 3D environment. Uh, what, what my preference is, is that we help uh, to to bring their information into our 3D environment as, as efficiently as we can, but trying to move everyone slowly into that 3D environment. And, and the main thing, like I say, is trying to get those that are reviewing design information into that 3D environment, because I think that's a better space for people that are not trained to imagine what a 2D you know, set of drawings looks like. Because I think as architects, we forget that. We're trained to think in 3D and translate that into 2D. And, mm. and contractors are trained to take 2D information and translate that into a built building. And and coming back to that paradigm shift, Rion, um, there's a book called The 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 Alphabet and the Algorithm. Might have got that the wrong way around, but it's, it's a great book. And and that's that was one of these books that did get me thinking about the whole 2D paradigm. And you know, in, in the Middle Ages, when Brunelleschi and others figured out, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure if this master builder thing's for me. I'm not sure if I want to be on site all the time to get these things built. And they, so well, why don't we do a scaled version of these buildings? And and you've, uh, to me, that's one of the the kind of few paradigms that there has been in the way that we design buildings, the, that notion of producing a scaled version of the building and mm. something that was obviously honed over 500 years. And I guess what I see the future as being is, the, is that next paradigm shift where we go beyond that 2D paradigm into one where we're using VR and, and other tools to really imagine the building in 3D. 
and the, and the VR one's quite an interesting one because we we tend to see that as a gimmick uh, rather than as a contractual deliverable that adds value to the whole design process. So, and and I find that's quite bizarre. So we've got this one thing that would totally transform the way we design buildings, and we somehow see it as a little bit of a bolt on or something rather than this is what I want. And I, in fact, I'd rather have this than a set of drawings. That's really interesting, actually, particularly, you know, the, the, yeah. the sort of levels of sophistication that can be reached in these 3D environments now, and that we're very much attached to, yeah, the, the printed drawing as that that's the kind of, that is the, the such the, the normal mode of deliverable, Yeah. when actually yeah. it's it's kind of almost taking one step back from yeah. the design in order to, to, to deliver it. Can you, can you explain a little bit about the vertical integration that happens at ACOM that enables you to be able to... To, to work like this and implement innovation in terms of the different kinds of service offerings that you have? Yeah, well, that, that we're, we are quite lucky that we've got uh, pretty much every discipline required to design a building with a few uh, exceptions. So, so it, it certainly does help us. And one of the things that we have been doing in some projects is integrating the modeling of the architecture and the engineering. Uh, and it's, it's coming back to the point that, that I mean, we, we, we create these spaces now rather than drawings. And mm. uh, if you, again, if you imagine a space, whether it's um, a living room in a residential project or an operating theater, the client's really not that fussed at concept stage what's behind the paint. So we, we call these spaces paint in spaces because it's really everything that the client sees. Mm. Uh, because at the end of the day, does a client really care at concept design stage, whether there's a bit of plasterboard or a blockwork wall or a piece of concrete that's behind that paint? Mm. And, uh, and so these spaces um, we see as the way f forward in terms of defining what the client is going to see. And the same, there might be a floor finish, but maybe not a screed below that. And certainly in our spaces, we will model the ceilings. And certainly I, I do have a lot of people that say to me, well, this sounds scary like standardization. And well, what we try and say, well, it's not really about standardization. It's just really about much, much better information. And more importantly, it's about consistency because if we're working from a library of spaces, now again, go back to the current process as an architect, as I do a 2D plan, that's part of my creative process. And yeah. I imagine what that looks like in 3D. If you can then imagine a space that I've already created, it's got sockets in it. If it's in a residential project, it's got those located for the furniture, typically say in a bedroom, I've got all the doors, I have the ironmonger. There's nothing that stops me on the next project changing some of that. I can do different ironmonger. I can move things around, but, but certainly, uh, you know, everything that's in there that needs to be there is in there in the first place. And and one example that I do use quite often when I'm talking to clients is a staircase. We we figured that to design a staircase needs 150 decisions. And and that wasn't that was a that was quick quick kind of couple of hour brainstorm. I'm I'm sure if we put our mind to it and you know flushed that out for a bit longer, we could get more decisions. And these digital libraries that we call them, if we use those as a starting point, then first of all, we're making sure that we don't forget about things. But secondly, we can have a much more mature conversation with clients earlier on about uh, finishes, um, whether that's around DDA or whether it's about construction or whether it's about something more pragmatic like the you know, is the dry riser can evolve um, in the staircase exposed or is it in a box? Um, so in a sense, we're, we're using uh, our digital library as, as, as a way of containing knowledge as much as it's containing design and, and, and other aspects of the process. These, these libraries that you create, are these, um, do they become open source types of libraries or are they kind of um, held within, just within ACOM itself as a resource? Or? At, th at this point in time, obviously held within ACOM. Uh, yeah. And... Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, you're right. From an IP perspective, the, all the technological discussions just now are, do you embrace uh, uh, open source solutions or do you, you know, go down an IP route? I, I would say that at this point in time, we're more kind of minded to go down an IP route. But that's yeah. not to say that there's some tools that we use like Dynamo, for example, which is open source software. So we, we do engage with some open source initiatives and certainly we're working with IFC and, and other formats and we're more than happy to help uh, to develop these for the, the greater good of the industry. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I thought it was interesting. Yeah. We look at um, companies like Bride and Wood, for example. Yeah, um, how they've got on some of their initiatives, they're kind of like they have platforms which are open source and obviously gives the clients the uh, ability to be able to share details amongst you know kind of multi-headed complex clients to to kind of speed the innovation up in in certain degrees. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm aware of some of the tools that Brian would have uh, put together. I think some of them are great, but they are still very early stage kind of conceptual tools. Uh, mm. I think so, some of the, the libraries that we're doing have got a huge amount of data on them. So they're, they're next uh, part of the process down and they're, they're, let's say there's a huge amount of data in them that is obviously driven by the, the experience of our teams across the, across the globe. Got it. And, and in, in terms of um, the other sort of services that ACOM produce, what's the relationship that you have with the, with contractors and actual and manufacturers? Is that something that's, is that in-house as well, or is that not? No, I mean, we, we, we did, uh, we did kind of consider a few years ago about whether we, we should get into kind of end to end process. But uh, right. I think the view now is that we're better placed as, as being designers and, and, and providing the consultancy required to, to do a broad range of, well, pretty much everything in the built environment from a railway to uh, a water kind of uh, kind of whether that's ports or or water kind of other water facilities or and and of course all the usual buildings and uh, from hospitals to residential and and again an infrastructure through to bridges and railways and so on and so forth so quite a, a broad range of pretty much anything in the built environment got it got it and and what are your kind of perceptions or views over that relationship between architect and and manufacturer and and contractor kind of being yeah. collapsed and is and is the the sort of 3d space modeling is that another way of kind of speeding up that kind of integration if you like uh, no I think it's a really good question it's something that we we do spend a lot of time thinking about I, what i do find is that uh I mean, we have a lot of procurement conversations as as an industry just now. I, I, I don't think we've got a model that is future fit yet. Right. Uh, I, I, and I, I would say that most of the tweaks that I've seen in recent years for me are about optimizing traditional. They, they come into that bucket because certainly if if you look at the, the, I mean, and one of the things we haven't spoken about yet is that, I mean, the spaces that we build are either construction or manufacture ready. So we, we've started to use uh, some of the software tools of the, the manufacturer in, in our workflow in recent years. And if I look at that workflow from you know, the first sketch that might be done through to, let's say, the, the optimum set of information for manufacturing, that certainly the procurement piece in the middle is creating a lot of the friction. So I don't, I don't think we're allowing information to flow. And, and, and if you look at an automated future, and the ability to flow from that sketch almost automatically into a set of manufacturing information is, is far from optimal. And uh, it's really difficult to try and predict how that will play out because, uh, you know, going back to the Middle Ages, we, 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 we separated that process of design and construction and, and design and build, whether it's design and build or traditional, I would say that we're still, we still really have that separation between the design process and the making process, and and I mean, the, the, having said that, I think there there are some signs of maybe solutions in the horizon. So, mm. on on some projects, we're looking at producing first stage fabrication drawings, so that we can start to dip our toes into the other side of the what the manufacturers are doing. So to try and make the process more seamless. Yeah. Uh, I certainly think this notion of producing design intent information that then someone else picks up and, and there's a whole bunch of workflows they learn what to do is, I mean, that creates a huge uh, deal of inefficiency. But when we really start to look to the future, um, I mean, as I'm sure you know, Rion, that we hear lots of people talking about, well, why, why is uh, construction not like the car industry? Yeah. And uh, I think there's a very good reason for that, actually. And, and that's not to say, I think we've got some huge lessons to learn from manufacturing, not just car industry, aerospace or shipbuilding and so on. But buildings, uh, you know, I mean, if you think about it, 
nothing else is constructed. Every, even a ship is is built at the side of a river and then it's floated down and off it goes to wherever its final destination is. And even kind of uh, factories for planes are normally at the side of an airport and the plane that then gets flown to its, its customer and so on. Buildings are one of the very few things that have to get built in a location, hence the name construction. Mm. And I think what we underestimate at times is how much innovation and invention there has been over thousands and thousands of years. And and of course, buildings use very different materials. We tend to use very natural materials, a lot of wood. We use gypsum, we use clay. And um, and so we're using very, very different materials to the construction industry yeah. and sorry, <laughs> to the to the um, manufacturing in- industry. And of course, building a building in a specific site, even if you look to standardize, I think comes with challenges because different sites have got different ground conditions. We've got different services integration. So, so even if you had a building type that was repeatable, you would still need some form of site intervention for you know whether it's fences and landscaping or utilities. There, there's still always a piece of the jigsaw that would need to be done in relation to, to site. It's, it's not as if we're rolling off a production line uh, and hey-ho, that's the end of the process. There, there's always a piece. And certainly the uh, a couple of years ago, we, we started to talk about the convergence of manufacturing and construction mm-hmm. rather than a shift from construction to manufacturing. And and I think we've got a long way to go on that journey. I, th- I think the there there's a lot that needs to get thought through. And I, I certainly think that there's a, for example, how do we conceive the products of the future? So you spoke about Bride and Wood earlier on, and you know they're a big fan of subassembly and and those things. And I, I think the products that we need to move to more manufacturing driven kind of uh, industry don't exist just now. So. Um, I'm on an NLA group and we're, we're, we were talking about that and I say, well, maybe we should have a competition to try and imagine the products of the future. So, and mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. So yeah. there, there isn't a place I can go that would allow me to, for example, specify even one wall of a bathroom where, which would have a sink, the taps and all the, and all the plumbing and so on installed that I can then plump, plump, no, just plug it into a residential project that sort of thing doesn't exist as a product so and and e- even a toilet pod for a residential project project there is nothing that exists as a product that i can just go to a catalog and say yep i'll have one of these and you think that as we speak today how many how many kind of people in the uk do you think are drawing um a disabled toilet for a building. So somewhere in the UK, I can d- guarantee there's probably a dozen people drawing um, a disabled toilet for a project. More than a dozen. <laughs> More than a dozen, yeah, yeah. As we speak, and and yet they're all the same. So, I mean, that, that, that in a sense, kind of uh, exemplifies how crazy the, the current system that, is. That's really interesting because it's always been, you know, you have these either kind of incredibly granular products like a single toilet or a single tap or a single... You know, you know, a, a one yeah. piece of a of a cladding system, for example, or the other the other extreme is kind of like you know, complete houses yeah. that are completely rolled off. And the there's been a lot of you know, the construction industry hasn't really a, you know the the idea of manufactured homes has been around since you know post war. It's been around for yeah. a long or even even longer really. It's been around for for a, for a long long time, but it's never really taken off and what you're sort of suggesting is actually it's more about architectural products which are kind of kind of elements as opposed to trying to complete an entire building yeah, I, I think the the hotel industry uh, leveraged uh, volumetric construction what 10 maybe even 20 years ago and has been yeah. using it with great success since then and and I, and I think it's fantastic to see the residential sector now ha- having gone that way in the last two or three years, but mm. in a sense, they should have been doing that ten years ago, uh, and and so there's a massive catch up to be to be had, uh, and of course that's where we see that the industry is really struggling because the supply chain are not there, and, and of course the likes of Mark Farmer's report is is all about how do we scale up for this, but mm. I, I I think the the future though for 
give, given for other building types. Uh, I mean, I, I don't see myself 3D printing an airport anytime soon, uh, n- nor do I see an airport being fundamentally about v- being volumetric. Maybe pieces mm. of, of it, we might take some of the, um, you know, the toilets and all that sort of stuff. Again, which people have been doing in office buildings for donkeys uh, years as well, looking at how to make those things volumetric. But I, I think the future is about a new generation of flat pack product. But no, like I'm saying, why can't I buy a flat pack p- toilet out of a catalog for a residential project where I could configure the same way going back to there's there's one of the analogies back into the car industry. Mm. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of con- configurators. And, th- and that's something that my team have been working on is how, how do we configure uh, things uh, in, in a design process? Uh, but I think more importantly, we, we figured out how to do that. But how do we then get the manufacturers to make that content that instead of we we'll go back to that disabled toilet, instead of designing one, I just go to a catalog and I say, OK, yeah, this is the one that I have here. Because I can guarantee those dozen or so people that are currently working on a disabled toilet will forget something. I, I guarantee if we check all that those 12 drawings, each one will have one or two things missing. And um, and and I think one of the ways around that is back to your point, maybe there is open source libraries for some of these things. Or, But what I think would be great is that we, if, if the manufacturers just made these things and that we could just specify them straight out of a catalog. So, so I, I do see the... And again, it's not new. I mean, the Victorians, if you think about the cornices and some of the living rooms that we, we, we see and the railings, cast iron railings and so on, there was a huge use of pattern books in the, by the Victorians. And it'd be mm. great if we reconceived that whole notion of the, 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 the kind of pattern book with manufacturers, which would be the product of the future. What, what are some of the obstacles facing that kind of future? Uh, I, I suppose for manufacturers to do that, they would have to invest. So they, they would need to see, I, I suppose, the, the confidence that things would get specified uh, mm. in order for them to invest. So may, maybe that's something that the government could be trying to do is is, is trying to uh, underwrite an investment costs for some of these developments so that and maybe these are even paid back if if the companies get sufficient turnover uh, with these new investments over time but mm. i suppose something that it's, it's I suppose it's the chicken and egg isn't it Rion? it's like how, how do we do that and it's back to the supply chain being kind of fragmented in the industry the it's difficult it's difficult to know how to imagine that product in the first place but then to figure out um who's going to actually be the the companies that make that but i, I think we will see that because I, I suppose some companies will take the leap of faith to you know they, they see the the off-site manufacturing is is becoming commonplace and, and and i think we are seeing more product manufacturers acknowledge that and embracing that so uh, maybe it's something that will just come with time how, how do you approach your clients with kind of new innovation or how do you de-risk it for them? Or do they not see it as a risk and they're kind of like they're coming to you because they want something highly innovative? Well, some, some clients uh, are uh, really trying to push the DFRMA agenda. So they're, right. they're coming for us trying to get uh, uh, us to help them to figure out how to kind of make their own kind of uh, buildings more kind of suited to manufacture. Uh, other times, uh, it, I, I suppose it's just back of house, really. It's, it's, the, the, the process efficiency is maybe not even seen by the client. Um, but I guess it will be if we're trying to transform the deliverables that we that we you know, give the client at the end of the project. But my view is that what, what we're trying to do is, is to work, work you know, much kind of, uh, more efficiently for clients and look at deliverables that will add more value to, to at the end of the process. Right. And of course, the sustainability is making, I think, is really starting to push the whole data agenda because mm-hmm. I, I think as architects, we've, I think we're only really dipping our toe uh, into the into the data conversation. Uh, I think we're excited about data if it's parametric and leads to this exciting geometry. I'm not convinced that we're excited about data that might, like, for example, minimize uh, 
the the amount of time it takes to produce a CFD model so that I can get my you know lead designer kind of uh, iterations reduced. Well, it's not as visually um, tangible. Yeah, exactly. And a lot. I think we will see some uh, shifts on the the data for carbon, for example. I think mm. we're we are really starting to see some tools. And I was I was watching a a video over the holiday where you know Buckminster Fuller asks Norman Foster or uh, you know how heavy is your building? And and I think that is the sort of thing when you when you start to get into uh, into the world of manufacturing. Uh, that's the sort of information that you need because you, if you're if you're starting to make bigger pieces, you need to understand how heavy they are for transportation and for craneage and so on. So, I think uh, that will become an automatic default of the architect to the future, where they automatically know how heavy their building is because mm-hmm. it becomes a an essential thing to do for sustainability and for offsite manufacturing. And and how is um, research for innovation structured within ACOM? Is it something that you have your own uh, sort of research and development teams that are kind of working, you know, as a kind of an, a unit in them in and of themselves, and then you're looking for the right projects where these ideas can be implemented, or does it come about through? The demands of a specific project and you've got a kind of enough enough in-house specialist knowledge and expertise that you can start yeah, pushing those we, we we don't have a specific r d department per se but mm. we, what we do like to do is to have lots of incremental uh innovations so we, we we do have lots of competitions to try and encourage people to come up with ideas to make process more efficient and we, we do also have a, a global digital transformation team that, that looks at how to, you know, to, if you like, to communicate all the different innovations globally. Because as you can imagine, when we've got so many people with so many ideas, trying to connect ideas to the projects is, is really crucial. Yeah. And we, we've just in the process of restructuring um, ACOM. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that is we, we've realized in the, in the COVID environment that actually we can now put together teams from anywhere in the world because wow. uh, obviously, I, I, and in fact, I would say in the last six months, I'm increasingly in calls early in the morning to Australia or late in the afternoon to the States because, uh, and again, the, the, the biggest problem that we've got is when you try to get uh, the US, Australia and the UK uh, together at the same time, uh, someone loses out with the awkward <laughs> timing of the meeting. But aside, aside from that, uh, we're, we are seeing the benefit of bringing teams together globally and putting the best people uh, into the best into the you know into the projects to to try and drive that innovation. What's the kind of scale that ACOM is at at the moment? Uh, of- we're sixty thousand people just now wow. across the globe. That's, ex- that's extraordinary. And um, I, I'm, I'm presuming you've got headquarters offices in most major cities. And Yeah, we're, we're in 150 different countries across the, the globe. So, so we, we've got good coverage uh, all over the, the world, yeah. Got it, got it. Amazing. That's really, really, really amazing. And to arc back a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing with the REBA plan of work, um, how has your role as director of innovation influenced, or how, how has the work you've done with the with the RBA influenced each other? What's the interaction there? Uh, no, that, that's a good question. I I, I suppose I, I really like I said I, I've published a, I published I think my first book on design management. Um, I don't know, it was maybe fifteen years ago, mm. and. Uh, like I say, I've always really been interested in the in the process of how we design buildings, because I've I've always been involved in large complex buildings, and and so I I am quite fascinated about how we make that process much more efficient. Um, and the the RAB plan of work was just an extension of of that you know process kind of side of things and. Uh, in two, I suppose the 2013 was as much trying to take feedback that we'd gleaned from industry and, and trying to box off some of the, the cultural issues that we had seen with the plan of work. So, for example, uh, design appearing in stage five was, was a good example of right. that. Uh, and uh, 
And and the other thing was that some of the guidance that I wrote in 2013 was obviously paid for. And, and so we were trying to make some of that guidance as part of the overview document so that it had a broader circulation, which obviously tends to happen when you make things free. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I, I, I do find that even writing an article for a magazine uh, makes me have to think through the process. So, so I do, I do like writing about process and, and the plan of work was great for, for, for just getting the opportunity to try and figure out how can we make this whole process better? How can we communicate that? And how can we standardize? Because, because I think part of the problem just now is that we're all kind of innovating in our own ways, Mm. which in a sense, creates a challenge because how does a client choose my innovation over someone else's? Whose is the best innovation? And I'm, I'm not sure what that might look like in the future. I can certainly see multidisciplinary design becoming more commonplace in the future because certainly the work that I'm doing uh, gets driven much more effectively when I can manage the whole design team, uh, which obviously I'm able to do if, if we are holding the, the single contract. Mm. Yeah, this this seems like an increasing kind of business model that I'm in, encountering a lot in the in the industry, and and particularly from other disciplines who aren't necessarily architectural focused but are in the construction world. They're offering kind of turnkey solutions to to their to their clients or kind of vertically integrated, um, you know, uh, business models which seems to make uh, well, it, it gives a, an incredible amount of simplicity from the clients end of the game, end of the experience. Well, I would, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, although having said that, we, we still are seeing many, many clients uh, commissioning design teams on on an individual basis. Right. And I'm, I'm not sure at what point the where the pivot point is. I, I still think there's a, some work to be done in terms of multidisciplinary firms demonstrating that they're more efficient over the traditional fragmented approach. But uh, I think that point is probably uh, a couple of years away. And I think if we, if we see those true uh, productivity gains, and, and it, it may not you know, necessarily be a fee calculation. It might just right. be that it's about producing more information faster and better. So for example, if I can produce my designs much faster because I can take out some of the iterative process, then that has a value to a client. And if I can produce better information to feed into the whole life process, then again, that has a value. But of course, uh, that that needs to be thought through and figured out as part of that kind of integrated workflow that you're imagining. I mean, I do talk about automation a lot and I think we're, we are beginning to see the fruit, the fruits of design automation starting to come through. Uh, I think stage four will be the first stage to, to get automated. Certainly, I mean, my team's not far away from being able to do that stage in 30 minutes, as I would say. Um, you know, but there, but there is a, there is a, a complexity to that because obviously to, to get stage four to work in thirty minutes, I actually need to push some of the workflow into stage three or into stage two, but part of that is assisted if I'm working with libraries of information from the start. So, um, so it's not a case of, I mean, the, doing stage four in thirty minutes sounds like a, a long haul, but I mean, e- even some of our technology companies years ago were saying to me, Dale, you know, you can do it today, which is so true. Mm. Uh, I think there, there's the cultural resistance to doing it. There's the lack of understanding of what it takes to do it. But of course, that that in order to do it, you are moving things around, and you know you. So, so right now, even at stage at stage two, we're using construction ready information to present spaces to our client. So our our digital library approach is part of that automation because we're structuring our information in a way that we can then use it much more efficiently downstream. Mm. It's fascinating. What's the, there's a couple of things there you said about the, the cultural resistance in the, let's look at the cultural resistance in with architects firstly. Yeah. Um, what is at the root of some of that and what do you and what do you mean by the cultural resistance to, towards it I, I think the main the main resistance is the is, is that word standardization I think mm. that but I, I, but I mean 
it, certainly nothing nothing about what I do is about standardization. It, it's about consistency and it's about faster production of information. Uh, one one kind of thought piece that I quite like to ask architects, I, I say, okay, so in the future, how would you feel that instead of issuing a, a pack of information at stage four, you have to hit the print button? And and before the answer, I'll say. And before you before you kind of answered, the print button is not a literal 3D print button. It, it just means that you cannot change your information. There's no RFIs from the contractor. The information has to be rock solid because things are being ordered, things are being made. So there, there's no going backwards. And you know, I would say that you know at least seven out of ten architects are really uncomfortable with that as a proposition. Which, in a sense, as a profession, we're acknowledging that our information could be better. And I think. That's really what I'm talking about. It's a future where the information that we produce at that stage four is 100% reliable mm. and it's derived from more in intelligent information upstream as we're doing the design process. So so I, I think the resistance is maybe just people not understanding the art of the possible. Yeah, And uh, it, it's also about, like I say, that fear that somehow we're trying to standardize things. But Look, I mean, I don't think anyone would ever see, uh, you know, London uh, being a, a city where every single building came from the same DNA. I mean, uh, as I sometimes say, well, w would that not mean that uh, London would just end up looking like Moscow in 1970? You know, it's where there, there was this huge amount of repetition. I, I don't ever see that happening. I still think, I mean, what, every year I'm absolutely blown away by the quality that we see with the the sterling kind of uh, prize and the, the the diversity of architecture that's coming out i think we're there's some brilliant buildings being kind of produced by architects but i, I just think we need to move away from this bespoke process and i think there are roots to that but at the same time the the other flip side of that is well should we see buildings as products and again, I think schools were seeing that. So there are some sectors. So there are some uh, uh, residential clients that are doing products. There, there's a firm of architects in the Isle of Skye. I, I love what they're doing. You can go to them and buy one of their products, which is, you know, they've got three or four houses that are that that can be bought off the shelf. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think it's, I, I think it's in. Sure. Yeah, or yeah, or or you can, or you can um, obviously have a bespoke building, which uh, in their case has has got a good chance of winning an RIB award. So, <laughs> so, but the, the roadmaps there, you you've got better cost control and a fixed cost for the, the architecture, but it's it comes from that pattern book, or you can get the the customized approach. And but I, I don't see that approach applying to other building types, but which is why I see that mass customization. So the, the configuration of, of libraries and so on, to me, is part of that process and, and acknowledging that within that configuration process that you can mm. still, uh, you know, uh, make changes uh, of, of whatever elk you want. It could be 20% on one project. It could be 40% on the next. Um, and I, I suppose for me that ev even if we're designing a kitchen on a regular basis, we somehow tend to do it from scratch. So I think more people using libraries where there's absolute clarity of information around, you know, like so, taking a kitchen, where's the spur points for the oven and the and the and the fridge point, and you know where's the stopcocks? All all of that information. Some people have probably never even had that information on the stage four information ever, but some, it needs to come from somewhere if the contractor is going to do their job properly. Yeah, yeah, well, that's what's really it is really fascinating and a, and a kind of very profound um, paradigm shift as yeah. as well, kind of thinking like that. I remember I was speaking with uh, Patrick McLeamy uh, not so long ago of HOK and obviously he, he talks about the lots of these sorts of things with the McLeamy curve as well, right? yeah. getting, your, getting your information ready at those early stages because it's like that, you know, there's there's this huge cost differential if you make a change early on as opposed to when you make it um, um, later on. And also the idea of um, thinking about a building less about less of it as being a building but more of an assembly yeah so, so it is it is kind of like how we're coordinating the assemblage of these complex parts and what are the and you know what the efficiencies that yeah. can be developed from when we start thinking about the way that yeah. you're you're saying here well that's true I, well one thing that we do that, that we do need to to kind of just think about for a few minutes is mm. is the the number of 
areas where change has been driven in the design process. So yeah. we've we've now got net zero. So we're trying to get our buildings to be, you know, not contributors to 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 the to the climate challenge. We've got the increase in, uh, and of course that comes in lots manifests itself in lots of different ways from the materials we use. I think we might even need to think, rethink the aesthetics of our buildings to try and contribute less carbon. Uh, to the to the environment in the future, but of course, we, on top of that, we, we're trying to rethink and reimagine how we make buildings. Uh, and what I'm certainly finding is that, you know, back to my point at the start, the design process that we use is fundamentally driven by, you know, intuition or heuristics. So we're we're really relying on a building to come from the the knowledge that resides in in whoever's holding the the pen or the mouse or whatever they're using to to create those initial ideas mm. and i guess what where my my kind of thinking has gone recently is that that if we if we've all got to rebuild our intuitive database that resides in our in our in our heads uh, well, maybe we should make some of that database, you know, more kind of open. Well, back to your point, more open source, and try to share some of the knowledge required to design buildings. Mm. Uh, and I, and I think that sort of uh, industry wide cooperation is maybe required if we are to get to some of these net zero kind of standards. Because certainly anyone that's doing the lead designer role just now has got their work cut out because there's so many aspects to the process which are new, and of course. If you just take one new thing, it's going to change the dynamic. But if you have three or four new things, which we do, then, I mean, it's really challenging, I think, the the lead designer proposition just now, because we're all having to rebuild a new database of knowledge. And, and I guess what I'm trying to say is, well, if, if we're trying to do it, maybe let's do that more digitally so that we can share that new knowledge mm-hmm. learning and, and really help to drive architecture towards not just that paradigm shift in the way that we design, but to make sure that we hit our targets by 2030. Fascinating. What what do, what are your thoughts on the kind of evolving role of artificial intelligence in in almost being able to to provide design automation? Yeah. So I, I was speaking at a couple of conferences, not not last year, uh, but the year before on on AI, and certainly a lot of the 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 things that I see people talk about uh, AI are not actually AI. They're they're just kind of rules based design. But when it comes to true artificial intelligence, um, we, we've been looking at some machine learning tools and where we see the limitations just now is that those tools really become added value in terms of uh, detecting anomalies. And I mean, I, I was blown away with the first outcomes that we had from our machine learning kind of tools because it, it, it just picked up these little quirks in the model. That, and bearing in mind, it doesn't even know what a building is. It, it, it just picked out these things because it's obviously looking for patterns and it hadn't seen the pattern of these things that found out. So, mm. I mean, we, we talk about clash detection that personally, as, as anyone from any of our software companies will tell you that I'm, I'm, I, I hate clash detection because for me, it's a defeatist thing it's that because what, what i would have to say as a lead designer is well why why do we have that clash in the first place so i'm a big fan of like of how do you you know design you know move the work process well, sorry the workflow to avoid those clashes in the first place but where i see ai in the future is is certainly i mean we're seeing i think we'll see a lot of on generative design this year which is i mean it's still you know, it's, okay, there are some algorithms in there, which again are fundamentally rules, and and it's and and uh, and there is kind of platforms now becoming available to allow us to do that. But is that mm. really AI? Mm, possibly, possibly, but in in, in es- essence, it's it's more about computer power just crunching more you no know, multitude of options within a set of rules, i.e., algorithms. So not yeah. really true AI. But what I s- and 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 the big challenge to AI in our industry is that you know. The, I mean, in law, there's a lot of AI initiatives because the, there is access to huge amounts of uh, machine-readable data. And the problem we have is that, uh, and this is a problem that we came across, is just really difficult to get enough machine-readable data to get a machine learning tool to work. Because you know, up till now, most of our buildings, you no, know, even just 
whether it's a 3D model or whether it's a set of plans, they all exist in a server somewhere. So trying to aggregate all of these to a scale that AI can really start to learn is, is really tough. I, yeah. So, I, so I, I don't really see AI in its purest of senses really having an impact uh, for another five years. Um, yeah. I think, we, yes, we will see some benefits in terms of anomaly detection and using it to check what we do. But in terms of the design process, I think it'll take a bit longer to get some pure AI initiatives uh, coming in our industry. That's really, really interesting. And and of course, robotics. How do you see the, the future of robotics? Kind of, uh, and, and, and is that something that ACOM is involved in? To keep, you know, we, we spoke before about some of the... Um, yeah, advances that companies like Boston Dynamics are, are doing and how they're getting yeah, we 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 signed a deal a number of years ago with Winston in Hong Kong to and, and certainly one of my guys was in China for a, for a while helping to do some stuff around that, but uh, I'm, I'm not I mean we we are looking at some three D printing initiatives but probably less orientated to the single house kind of things that you're doing more to do with metal printing uh, uh, but but certainly I, I think the big challenge for robotics is robots need stability so mm -hmm. you know certainly a, a big six axis robot I don't really see them getting on site anytime soon uh, I mean, you you see some gantry cranes in some of the smaller houses, so maybe for a single residential development, an alternative to the 3D printed house might be uh, a gantry crane with robots on it that assembles a small building. Right. Uh, you know, if it can work off a gantry crane, but certainly for bigger projects, I think uh, it will be a long time till we see a robotic solutions. I think, uh, but but. Uh, and, and coming back to our point about larger products being made in factories, I mean, factories are the ideal thing for robots. And and I think that's where we really should see a massive efficiency improvement. There, there's some of the tiling companies I know are using robotics. So you've got that 24-7 manufacturing. And I think any 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 business that can use robots that are able to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, will see huge improvements. But, uh, and it's like volumetric. Some of my clients call it uh, construction under a roof because, you know, at the end of the day, you, you do get some benefits. There are some health and safety benefits, better working and conditions and all that, but ultimately it's still construction. Yeah. I think we will see a huge change if we can think of some products that could be made in factories using robotics, not quite the production line of the car factory. Um, although having said that the car factories, because of the, the mass customization of cars are, are seeing a change anyway, they're, they're, they're kind of moving away from the, the, the production line to, you know, to, to get more bespoke kind of uh, ways of making cars. So, I think I'd love to see more robotics coming to fruition, but I think it will be in the factory initially. Got it. Brilliant. Absolutely fascinating. And and what's what's your plans with um, with Acom for twenty twenty one? What sorts uh, of exciting initiatives are you are you looking forward to uh, participating in this year? Well, we've been doing. Uh, we we've last year we kind of. Um, figured out a new way of trying to uh, scale our kind of uh, 3D modeling into uh, into kind of projects, design and build contracts. We we called it mini models. So so we so if you can imagine a core for an office building is that what we do is we take the core of one floor and you know some buildings might have three cores. So we take one floor and one core and we we detail that core to uh, you know to anything well beyond current stage four norms, uh, even as part of the kind of concept stage. And what that allows us to do is to look at the, the buildability, it looks, uh, allows us to look at materials. Um, and, and, and I think that's the sort of thing that we're spending a lot of time on is looking at trying to get more and more into that 3D world and to, and to look at manufacturing type tools so that we can uh, really be modeling every nut and bowl uh, as part of that process. And, and coming back to the, how these tools fit with design, I think that what that then does give us is even more uh, ability to curate the, the design process because we're really looking at a lot of the things that may not even be picked up until things are well underway on site. So, mm. so it, it's really powering up um, our 3D models in a much higher level of detail. But I think the really crucial thing is that it's the data side of things that we're really looking at because uh, 
I suppose the two trends I would see into the future, I've already spoken about design automation at stage four, but I think part of stage four has to be uh, the design team and the specialist subcontractor working in tandem. But I, I right. certainly see that if we can get the data flowing much better, so connected data, I think we'll start to see stages two and three of the plan of work start to integrate. Because I think the key thing in the 2020 plan of work was about making sure that it's clear that stage two is all about having this incredibly good architectural concept, but making sure that that concept is robust because it has the right strategic engineering in there. So the right grids, the right floor yeah. to floor height, the plant rooms are the right size, which in, in turn dictates the right area. And I think if we can get some tools that would automate some of these calculations, whether it's the area for plan or whether it's the, you know, the some of the engineering aspects, I think we will start to see some of those iterations disappear that we we traditionally have, uh, either at stage two or stage three. So, so, so that th those are the things really that uh, I'm focused on this year. Three D, much much higher level of detail, starting to face, uh, you know, more kind of uh, auto, no, the, if you like, parts lists and things like that that are coming from the automotive industry, but crucially, really trying to connect all the data uh, sources that we have in a project and then try to then make um, some of the iterations more efficient. And the, the example I would always use is some of the CFD modeling that we need to do can take six weeks to create a standalone model. So if I can get that process down to, you know, basically, well, real time is obviously the ultimate goal, mm. then we can make the design process much more effective because we we're, we've got much, much better data to make those architectural decisions in a real time environment. It's extraordinary. Extraordinary. Brilliant. Thank you. I think it's a, a perfect place for us to conclude. Um, thank you so much for your your time and uh, contributions today. No, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, thanks for the invite. And uh, I've really enjoyed the conversation. So uh, thank you very much. Brilliant. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.